Awesome. Jane, thanks so much for joining us tonight. I mean, you've been a friend of Fresh Fiction and our book clubs for quite some time, joining us at different events. But for those that are new to us tonight, can you talk about how you got started in writing? <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> I, I, I sort of, it's all a blur. I don't really, I think this is one of those careers that uh, you stumble into. <laughs> It's never been something I could plan. It was never something that um, had a five-year plan or whatever. Uh, I just started because I'd been reading a lot of romantic suspense. I'd always loved romantic suspense from the time I was a little girl. Started out with Nancy Drew and moved on from there. And I think they're just, well, I know what happened was there just came a time when I wanted to tell the story my way. It wasn't that I thought I could do it better than the authors I was reading. I, that never crossed my mind. It was just, I wanted my story. I wanted my characters talking. And I think that's, that's how I got started. Having said that, I would, I would add that it took me six years to get published. So it was not one of those overnight successes. Those were back in the days before you had the option of uh, self-publishing and the gatekeepers in New York were pretty strict. So and how did that lead to you writing in several different genres? Because I was reading you as Amanda Quick back in the Desire and Mistress days before I knew you were Amanda Quick. And the same thing with uh, the Jane Castle paranormal and all those desk bunnies. And of course, then also your contemporary line. So was it a gradual or were all those stories already knocking around in your head? The stories were always there, but <laughs> the names were more of a, of a business issue. Either I signed away my name, which I have managed to do a couple of times because the contracts would often tie up a name. And in the early days when I, yeah, you don't see that. I don't think so much in contracts nowadays. Um, or if you do, don't sign them. <laughs> Having been there, done that. Um, but when I started out, it was pretty common for a publisher to tie up an author's name. And for that reason, the author often used a pen name so that they, you know, they can walk away. But that is the problem with those contracts because you, if you can't take the name with you, that's all you've got as a writer. So, so what you're looking at with every one of my names is a reinvention of a career. <laughs> I am probably one of the world's leading experts on reinventing writing careers. I have done it more times than I want to. But I will say that in the last few years, the three names I have now were all deliberate choices and they, and it was because of the three different worlds. And I just thought it would be best for readers to know which world they were getting when they picked up one of my books. So that's kind of why I'm, I'm now using the Jane Castle for the futuristics and the Jane Ann Krentz for the contemporaries and then the Amanda Quick for the historicals. So that's how it got, <laughs> it was messy. Well, one thing that I've also always loved, and you mentioned it too, that the romantic suspense has always been key for you. So even when I didn't know that you were these three different personalities, there were was that common thread in each of those genres. Again, something that came naturally, or is it different when you're writing in each of those different worlds to still maintain that baseline thread? No, the story is my core story. Mm -hmm. What changes in the world's is the fictional landscape and the kinds of plots I can do. But if you strip that away, my core story is always romantic suspense. And I would always, and I always hasten to add that I think it's a unique subgenre of, it's, an, it's a unique genre of its own. It's, it's not romance with a little mystery going on, on the side. It's not suspense with a love interest on the side. It really is the combination of the two and the, and the way I look at it is that if you have a novel of romantic suspense, you'll know it because you could not pull out the romance and have a story left, or you could not pull out the suspense and have a story left. They have to both be there. And the reason the plots work is because each is totally integrated with the other. Every twist in the suspense has to affect the relationship. Every twist in the relationship impacts 
the suspense and that's romantic suspense. Hmm. Oh, great. No, thanks for that explanation. Because I think you're right, especially when you're seeing things online, people get those confused sometimes or they have, they're bringing their own thoughts to that and, oh, well, I don't, I'm not really looking for the romance or it's like, no, it, it is really integrated together with that. Yeah. Not to get into how long you've been writing. Good. You have a few books. Have you seen that attitude or that approach change over time with, within each of the genres? And especially with that romantic suspense score? Uh, romantic suspense has always been strong. It really is an old genre and it's always going to be with us, I think, because it's a it's such a natural story, the, the, the two things working together, because it is the two things with the highest stakes, um, the, the relationship and the suspense, each, each impacts the, the stakes in the other and makes it more dramatic, I think. It's also a personal story, um, as opposed to say a war story or a story where the, in, in the case of a war story, the war is a character in a sense in the novel. It is the overarching storyline, but in romantic suspense, it's a more intimate story. And it has to do with the two, the two main characters and whatever is threatening them. Um, and that shows up very nicely and, and really took off big in the paranormal. And I think one of the reasons the paranormal was so big in romantic suspense and in romance in, in general is because everything is larger than life. The characters are larger than life. The threat is larger than life, but also in a sense, in an odd way, it's a safe way to enjoy high drama and great danger. Um, you don't have to watch somebody being eviscerated on the, on the page. It's not like a serial killer novel, which is for me too real. You know, it's too, it's too, but I can, but, but I'm happy with the bad guys in the paranormal story getting, you know, <laughs> getting whacked. So <laughs> it's, it's just more of a romp, I guess you would say for, for the storytelling. So I think the paranormal has been very strong across the romance genre because it is this kind of fun, exciting, larger than life ride. And, and it really took off in, in our genre, romance. I mean, that was where it got its legs and it's always been with us in one form or another, but romance has just boomed with it. And, um, and, and that's probably one of the bigger changes I have seen the historicals have always been with us one way or another. They come and they go. One of the things we're seeing now, actually, it's been around for a few years now. It's not new, but sometimes we don't recognize it, is the return of the Gothic novel. Oh, yes. I think you mentioned one of those last time you were visiting with us, um, Mexican Gothic, right? That was one of the earlier ones, yeah. But it's just, it's it's masquerading now under the, under the name psychological suspense. Nope. <laughs> but if you really look at it closely, you'll see that it's um, it's always an intimate story where the danger is within, not from without, but inside, literally often inside the house. People are often trapped in a giant house in an isolated remote, remote location and the threat is inside the house. And that's kind of the classic Gothic story. Um, and I think that's always been with us, but right now it's it's booming again. Yeah, I always picture you know that lone castle up on a cliff and some damsel running across a cliff in that classic white nightgown just billowing behind her. And yeah. to me, the gothic cover, right? <laughs> it, it was always it's it's been around forever. It's but it comes it ebbs and flows. And I think right now we're seeing the modern. My, my theory on the. Um, my theory on genres is always that there are no new genres. They just get reinvented. So sometimes they kind of fade away from this, from awareness. And then five years later, they're back. I noticed a lot of people tonight were commenting on reading paranormal again. And that's kind of ebbed and flowed in the past few years. And now it's coming back again, I think. 
again, I think a lot of people are looking for that escapism right now too. We've talked about that a lot in some of our previous get togethers. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons we read fiction. Yes, <laughs> exactly. No, no, I think it's, I think it's good for us. I think um, my theory on the fiction and the reason it's always going to be with us is because it carries forward and reaffirms our core values. When we read fiction, we always know what the hero is supposed to do when the chips are down. We know that heroes don't shoot people in the back. We know that heroes will sacrifice themselves to save the kid, to save the woman, to save the community. Um, those are core values for us. And fiction is where they keep getting refreshed. Well, transitioning off of that a little bit and that we're always, we always have expectations with the hero. Going to your latest book with the lightning in a mirror, this book has a villain from previous books, right? So he's now the hero. So how hard is that to, to spin the villain into the hero considering we now know the backstory, right? Well, I left him pretty vague early on, so I had room to resurrect him. I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to ruin him at the start so that he couldn't be used again. So, it, uh, yeah, that, that, it's tricky making, it, the problem with doing a good anti-hero or whatever you want to call it, um, is, is you got to leave room for <laughs> making them work as a hero. And uh, so the easiest way to do that is just not to, talk about it too much <laughs> until you get to his story. There's always a reason. And was he also talking to you as a character saying, hey, I'm not that bad. <laughs> Let well, me show my true story here. Yeah, I had made the father bad. I had made the father a mob boss, essentially. And this, this young man was going to be the heir to the father's throne, essentially, as a mob boss. Um, until the other heroes took care of him and then <laughs> it's, it got complicated, but uh, I gave him a kind of an out early on where he didn't actually do anything horrible, unforgettable. And then also the heroine, Olivia has powers that she doesn't want to admit in this story. Again, kind of again, harkening back to that paranormal touch that we were discussing before. I mean, where do you get the that inspiration ideas to pull that back into the story well first of all i should specify for those reading paranormal who love paranormal i should make it clear that i don't do the supernatural side of paranormal i do the psychic vibe which to me and there's a for me there's a strong there's a very bright line between the two so you're not going to find shapeshifters and um witches and vampires in my books I don't the, I consider those super I can read those stories and enjoy them but they don't fit my core story and so I don't write them but I do love the psychic vibe and that I think works for a lot of readers and it works for me because in a lot of ways it's just one step beyond intuition and everybody has some in or or thinks they have intuition <laughs> I guess it's questionable whether we've actually got it out but um but intuition, dreams, those kinds of elements are, are make it easy to, for a jumping off point for this, the whole psychic vibe. And that's, I mean, I mean, how many people will tell you that they've walked into a house and felt a chill, you know, that it's just something wrong with this house, you know, and you don't know how to, dis what do you, what do you call that? You know, um, what do you call it when, and, and, and on the, physical level think about how much we are affected by music i mean it doesn't physically touch us it's just something we hear but it can send a chill down your spine or it can make you feel glorious or it can put you to sleep i mean there's a lot of power in music that doesn't have a real explanation if you ask me that we know of and i think um you know there are there are other things that we respond to in the world just intuitively and that gives me my plots. <laughs> and I would expect that's just an additional fun element when you are writing of how else can I put that in or that it adds an additional layer to your stories. Well, it certainly adds a layer. It, it does two things for me 
as a writer, it adds a layer of um, emotional uh, intensity between the characters because they bond essentially on another level. In addition to the, the normal romantic elements, I've got that psychic bond that, that gives a real intimacy to the connection. Um, and it also allows me to do mystery plots because I always plot with a mystery, always have a murder mystery going on. And it allows me to do that without having to worry about police procedural stuff and the forensics and the, all, the, all the stuff that gets in the way, cell phones for crying out loud. <laughs> the rise of the cell phone really ruined the whole, it really complicated the mystery genre, let me tell you. So, so with the psychic crimes, I don't have to worry about that. You know, that, that technology starts getting in the way, right? <laughs> does it really does i think one of the reasons i always enjoyed the, the historicals was because so much of that is not there either mm -hmm. and you get back to solving the crime based on kind of the sherlockian approach you know with with logic and facts that, that you fit together and um those so I, I enjoyed plotting in the historicals for that reason too the hardest things to write plot-wise for me, are the contemporary romantic suspense if I don't have the psychic vibe. Oh. Yeah, so those would be the most complicated. And, and it's just the mechanics of the plot. That's mm -hmm. a lot of... And how much of that do you have actually plotted and planned out from the mystery standpoint? Do you have the basic story? And then do you have to go back to ensure, oh, no, I left a little hint here. <laughs> you know ultimately what's going to happen. I have an overall idea of the of the problem, I guess you would say, or the core issue that's going to be the the crux of the story. But the details are very elusive at the beginning, and they come into focus as I move through the story. And I would prefer to I would prefer to do it more methodically to have to know where I was going. You know, <laughs> it would be really nice to know where I'm going. Um, but I have learned over the years that I am going to get my best ideas once I actually start writing. And they won't be the ideas that I came up with at the beginning. I'll just, they'll be more interesting and more intriguing because I think the act of, the physical act of creativity actually promotes creativity, if that, if that makes sense. As opposed to sitting down and plotting out ahead of time where it's very um, cerebral, it's very, um, for me, it's not an intuitive process. It's more a mechanical process. You know, how do they get from point A to point B? And how do we find the body? You know, those are more mechanical things. Um, but, the, but the best ideas I'm going to get are going to happen in the actual writing process. So with this, where you managed to twist together Vortex and the Joneses, is that something that did happen organically? Did you have that in the back of your mind? I mean, how did you create the Jane verse, essentially? <laughs> well, that is it. I do have a Jane verse. I think every author has a universe that they spend their entire careers exploring. And I didn't realize that I had mine until my editor, Cindy Wong at Berkeley, pointed it out. <laughs> Sometimes you don't see the obvious. And that is, um, once, once you kind of recognize that, then you feel free to do things like that, I think. You don't. At least I, I felt free. It's like, this is a world in which it makes absolute sense that the Joneses and the Arcane Society would run up against a government, a secret government operation and didn't know about each other until it happened. I think that's a perfectly legitimate situation. <laughs> For people who follow the Jones stories, uh, the Arcane books, I will say that... Um, the identity of the illusion talent in some of those early Jones stories is revealed here. If you, for those who, who care about the, the fun, little stuff. <laughs> now, this of course was a trilogy, but you left a couple characters um, dangling a bit at the end. Um, yeah, yeah, I couldn't. Are stand there going to be that. more Fog Lake books or a new series on the horizon? It'll be a new series, but I wouldn't be surprised if some of the characters show up. That's that's the beauty of having this Jane verse now. I can bring them in. 
And what are the feelings of wrapping up Fog Lake then? I mean, even though it's going to continue in another form, I mean, just completing a trilogy in a series like that. I know it's hard. Celebrate with <laughs> it. <laughs> it's, it's hard because you get very fond of the whole characters. You get very fond of the setting. You, get, you know, it's just, it's hard to walk, walk too far away. So um, this, this was, this was kind of a sad goodbye for me. That's why I couldn't stand to wind it up at the very end altogether. <laughs> hope, I hope everybody who reads it will understand where I was coming from. I just couldn't say goodbye. But I, I've been pointing to it, um, this trilogy. I'm very proud of the fact that I did finish this trilogy. And contrary to rumors that have circulated for years, I proved I could finish a series. And I, I just want to want to make everybody know that. But we like revisiting a lot of these worlds and the stories. So there's some I don't think you'll ever be able to completely walk away from. Yeah. People will still be asking for the arcane societies. They will still come at you about the dust bunnies. I mean, they're just never going to go oh, away, the, right? The dust, the dust bunnies, I'll never escape. I, I keep saying they're going to be on my tombstone. It's going to be, um, <laughs> here lies what's your name? She wrote the dust bunny books. That's it. That's that's my future career. <laughs> that's going to be my obituary. Well, I don't want to leave you without running through some of our fresh fiction facts. You know, our rapid fire questions. <laughs> What first comes to your mind on some of these? And I'm going to try to hit some that Gwen hasn't asked you before. So this is probably going to be a little bit of a challenge. Uh oh. Um, so let's start with a fairly easy one. With whom would you want to be stuck in an elevator with during a disaster? I'm putting an extra spin on it. Uh, Fallon Jones. Oh, okay. That's my character from the Arcane Society. He's just so competent. He figure it out. In, in a disaster, in your stack, you want somebody who can figure things out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. More than just eye candy. You want somebody who can actually do something, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> he's got he's got some social issues in terms of his of his social skills, but by golly, he'd figure out how to get out of that elevator. <laughs> What is the motto you live by? <laughs> okay, motto I live by. Um, wine fixes everything. <laughs> oh, I can go with that. Okay. <laughs> that leads me to the next item then perhaps. What luxury item do you consider to be an absolute necessity? Luxury item. That's a tough one. Good sheets. Ooh. I, like I, regular smooth sheets or flannel or fleece? Those really, those really sat, sleek kinds of smooth sheets. Yeah. I love good sheets. I'm willing to pay for good sheets. Good towels. Oh, yeah. Good towels and good sheets. Oh, definitely. Yes. Yep. Yeah, that, that's one of my indulgences too. Get that high thread count. Yep. Switch out, especially with the different kinds of weather, you got to have the right sheets. Yeah. You want to be comfy in bed, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, what's your favorite writing fuel? Coffee. Mm. Like every other writer, I'm sure. <laughs> the caffeine in the morning is indispensable. Are you a snacker? No. No, just the coffee. That'll yeah. get you through. Cool. Yeah. If you couldn't be a writer, what would you do? I'd probably go back to my old job, which was librarian. Okay. And weren't you, didn't you work in as a corporate librarian also? Or? Yeah, I had, um, you had multiple times as a librarian, right? So I've worked at um, an academic library for a while, university library, corporate librarian, and one momentous year as a school librarian. Mm. <laughs> it was not my finest hour as a librarian, <laughs> but it did leave me with a profound respect for teachers and librarians who work with children. It's, it's a calling. Oh, wow. What's your favorite time of day to write? Oh, any day. I, I, I write seven days a week usually. So All the time. Hmm? 
Well, in that case, what's your favorite time of day to read? And do you also read every single day then? Yeah. If I've got nothing at home to read, if I don't have a book around to read, I'll be reading catalogs. <laughs> something. I, just the act of picking up something and looking and reading it is, is essential to me for some reason. Yeah. And I don't like to read on the computer because I spend my work life on the computer. So I prefer, I prefer to actually read a book rather than, um, if I can get it, rather than ebook. And it's strictly, it's, it's strictly because of the fact that I spend so much time on a computer working. And, and I can't work any other way, so I'm stuck. I only, I do my best writing when, I have, when I'm on a computer. And I think part of that is because um, handwriting, I can't keep up with my thoughts. A computer's the only thing I can keep up with. So. What book would you recommend to us right now that you've read lately? Especially since I want to splash up there. Yeah. Um, well, I'm really excited about Rachel Grant, who is a, not, not so much a new author, but this is a new series. And this particular book is called Crash Site. And the character, the ongoing character is Fiona Carver. And Fiona Carver, like Rachel herself, is an archaeologist. So the plot always is enmeshed with some really interesting uh, archaeology. And Rachel's one of those writers who just does a brilliant job incorporating the setting, the archaeology, the landscape. This, she's just, um, she's got a real gift for that kind of descriptive writing. And it's, I suppose you could say it's the newer, modern, sexier, edgier version of, um, of Amelia Peabody from the- Which I love, yes, yes. Yeah. For those who remember the Amelia Peabody stories, well, this is the modern one. <laughs> Fantastic. I'll have to check that out. I read all those Amelia Peabody's. I was a big fan and studied Egyptology as a hobby. So oh, perfect. Alley, you'll man. love this. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you'll love it. Awesome. If you ended up in a different time period, past or future, since you do delve into both, what three items would you have to have with you? My cell phone. <laughs> that doesn't work, does it? No. <laughs> oh gosh, wipes. <laughs> wipes. Um, I'd be looking for good plumbing. I mean, I just can't live without that hot shower in the morning. <laughs> I'm I'm pretty modern in my in my needs. I think I don't think I would do well in the past. That would not be my natural forte. <laughs> Let's make sure we have those practical conveniences with us, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan of modern plumbing and things like that. Well, what book world, yours or even another author's, would you want to step into? Oh, well, um, speaking of the past, Another author who does a really good job with research, which I do, I think the librarian part of me likes the authors who do a great job with incorporating the research into the storylines. And Victoria Thompson writes a historical mystery. I, I can't call it ro romance because she's married and happily married and there's a, good, there's a relationship, but it's not romance the way we think of it in romantic suspense. But... Vicky, Victoria Thompson does a great job with the research and this particular setting is the early 20th century, a um, little after uh, World War I. So it's just an interesting, it's an interesting time period, of, a, a period of great change and rapid change here in, the, here in the States and that she captures that. And you always learn something when you read one of her books. So. We had a big debate when you joined us um, after Readers and Ritas. What book of yours would you suggest to a reader who is brand new to you out of all of your different series and books? I always tell people to start with whatever I'm writing now, simply because I don't have a favorite myself. Different. Um, a lot of people will recommend Ravished, which was um, a classic Beauty and the Beast book from my um from the 19th century setting and uh, regency setting so and that was under my amanda quick name so a lot of people would say start with ravished if you like that 
historical era. Mm -hmm. If you like the futuristics, then anything from this series. The new uh, one, yes. Yeah, yeah, this is my Jane Castle books, which is the futuristic side of things. And, but I started out in, I started out in contemporary romantic suspense, and that's always going to be, you know, I, I can't see myself not doing it. So this current series, uh, which started, actually started with The Vanishing. Mm -hmm. This is my trilogy, people. For all those of you who hear I can't finish the series, this is proof. The Vanishing, All the Colors of Night, and then Lightning in a Mirror. So three books. I finished them. I finished them. And we're always looking forward to your next books, even though you finished this particular trilogy. So with that, where can readers stay in touch and find out more about you? Ah, yes. Well, my website, www.janeannkrentz.com, and that's Jane with a Y, is my home on the web. That's where you can find printable lists of all my books, all those books grouped by series, by year, how sorted a million different ways. And that's where you can find what's new, what's coming up next. It's kind of the core. Uh, but I'm also on Facebook and Instagram. Fantastic. So Jane, thank you so much for spending time with us this evening. Um, we always enjoy seeing you and talking with you and appreciate that you're going to be sticking around so our readers can have an intimate Q&A with you in our after party. It sounds like fun. Thank you so much. It was great. It's great to be here. I always enjoy these events.